of course, our, our resource person, Dr. Virendra Yadav, and there are teachers and many students here, student participants. Uh, let me introduce today's speaker for the first talk, Dr. Virendra Yadav. He is a scientist at Aribat Research Institute of Observational Science called ARIES uh, in Nainital. It is an autonomous institute under the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. The institute specializes in research in astronomy and astro atmospheric sciences. Uh, Dr. Virendra jo uh, joined ARIES in 2020 to take care of the science Polarization, popularization and outreach activities of the Institute. He is also the co-chair of Public Outreach and Educational Committee of the Astronomical Society of India for 22 to 25. Virendra did his BSc and MSc from University of Mumbai. I do remember 15 years back, like you participants here, he was student of astronomy course at Mumbai University and uh, it was a pleasure to teach his batch. Uh, he did his PhD at the Indian Institute of Geomagnetism, IIGM, Navi Mumbai, in the field of space physics. Uh, he was a research associate at IIG and then postdoctoral fellow at IIT Roorkee before joining Aries. He has 17 research papers in the international peer reviewed journals and has presented papers in many national and international conferences. Virendra is keenly interested in astronomy outreach and cultivation of scientific temper among students and society at large. He, lovely, he loves to interact with students and frequently gives popular talks on astronomy and space science. And our students at Wilson College also benefited from that. He had uh, come and given talks on geomagnetism and the areas of uh, plasma and uh, space physics. So welcome, Dr. Virendra, uh, for our uh, this new uh, idea of having a lecture series in the planetary science. And his lecture surely will benefit all young students because you can see a kind of role model in front of you. Uh, just last decade, he was like you, and today he is here on the platform sharing with you uh, many new uh, interesting ideas. Welcome, Virendra. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, Shubham, can you stop sharing the screen? Yeah. Okay, I think uh, you should be able to see the screens now. Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Uh, Thank you once again, uh, Shetty sir. And uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Virendra, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, planetary magnetic fields. And uh, uh, as uh, was very kind uh, uh, introduction given by Shetty sir, uh, you could see that I like to you know give popular talks and talk to uh, people and students about. Uh, you know, popularization of science. So that's why uh, uh, when Sati sir had told me that this is going to be um, a talk for undergraduate students. Uh, so uh, still I have kept it more uh, uh, from the popular point of view. So the talk is mostly filled with pictures. I have deliberately uh, not kept, uh, you know, any equations or anything like that. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, mostly talk in the terms of Earth, and I'll briefly mention the magnetic field of the other uh, planetary bodies. So, uh, and uh, since the time that I was given is around uh, one hour, 30 minutes, I was, I'm aiming for something like an hour or so for the talk. And uh, after that, uh, I would like to, you know, answer questions if you guys have any. So, yeah, and as you could see, I was trying to be uh, cheeky by using uh, the <clears throat> template for one of the Marvel movies, uh, Guardian of the Galaxies. So, yeah, let's uh, begin. And uh, before we talk about the magnetic fields or the planetary magnetic fields, 
uh, very briefly, I'll tell you what ARIES does and uh, who we are. And I mean, uh, you already heard that we specialize in astronomy and astrophysics, uh, but uh, I have a few pictures for you. So for example, here, uh, you can see this is our main campus. This is called as Manura Peak. It's in Nenital. And you can see that we are surrounded by a very lush green forest. And uh, in fact, uh, we are in the buffer zone of uh, Jim Corbett National Park, actually, okay, very close to that. So we do get uh, even leopards uh, a lot of time in our campus uh, during the evenings and early mornings. So uh, this is our main campus. And uh, let me see if I can share some pointer. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, I hope you can see the pointer as well. Uh, could someone confirm? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah. So this is uh, one of our uh, main telescopes. This is a, called as one meter Sampunan telescope. And uh, it's a 50 year old telescope. And as far as the growth of optical astronomy in India is concerned, uh, probably this is the most important telescope uh, with the uh, richest and largest legacy. There have been more than something like 400, 410 research papers uh, from this, uh, the, from the data of this telescope. And uh, there has been more than I think 64, 65 PhD thesis and many more are uh, in the pipeline. And some uh, four generations of scientists have been trained on this uh, uh, telescope already. Uh, the fifth one, is uh, undergoing their PhDs uh, at the moment in Aries and many other institutes. Uh, but because we are uh, not too far from Nenital town and uh, some of the nearby cities in the plains also have grown quite a bit since that telescope was established. So that site is not dark anymore. So in early 2000s and uh, 2010s, we moved to another campus called as Devastal Observatory Campus, which is around 60 kilometers from uh, Manura Peak. Uh, this is also in Nenital. And there we have three telescopes. Uh, the first one, this 1.3 meter telescope. Uh, the, these numbers basically just refer to the diameter uh, of the primary mirror. So uh, this has a diameter of 1.3 meter. Then 3.6 meter is the uh, India's largest uh, optical telescope, uh, the largest conventional optical telescope rather. Uh, so uh, here, as the name suggests, the diameter is 3.6 meters. Uh, the telescope became functional in 2016. And then uh, just uh, last year, we had uh, this International Liquid Mirror Telescope receive the first light. As the name suggests, uh, here uh, the mirror is a bit made up of uh, liquid uh, material. Uh, we'll briefly see that. So yeah, this is the 3.6 meter telescope as it looks. And uh, uh, the size may not give you, uh, um, uh, the size may not be very uh, apparent from this picture. But uh, this is probably as tall as a five-story building. And these uh, exhaust fan-like things, you see, these are as tall as human beings. And uh, this is how the telescope looks uh, from uh, inside the dome. And uh, yeah, so here you can see that this is a plastic chair. So you can imagine uh, what we the size of uh, this telescope, probably as tall as uh, two-story buildings. And uh, the telescope weighs 149 ton. Uh, so, but even with that huge amount of weight, uh, it can move very precisely and it can track the objects in the night sky for uh, as long as you want to observe them. Then uh, the liquid mirror telescope, uh, it's an international project uh, between uh, Canada, Belgium, uh, and India. Uh, the Canada and Belgium were the main funding partners. India has provided its location, the day-to-day -day running of the telescope, and the minor uh, uh, Funding as well as well as uh, uh, the data pipeline has been uh, made by Aries. So here, this is a very simple kind of telescope. Uh, so since it's liquid, too, you can't really move it in any direct, uh, any other direction. It always looks vertically upward. And here you have a four meter diameter, a very shallow bowl, and below that you have this air bearing, basically a motor, which is run by very high air pressure, and then. Uh, 50 liter mercury has been poured inside this and the the mirror is rotated with that air pressure at a continuous uh, and fixed speed. And uh, because of that, it's, uh, the mercury spreads out and it forms a very nice uh, paraboloid surface, which is required for a telescope. Uh, 
I have a brief video as well. Yeah, so this is how it moves. So these are the two uh, major facilities uh, as far as optical astronomy is concerned uh, at Aries. We also have a smaller group of atmospheric science, which mainly deals with the study of atmospheric parameters, uh, mountain metrology, as well as uh, pollution and uh, the Himalayas. So anyway, let us come back to today's topic. So before we go to you know understand how uh, a magnetic field, uh, or, or rather the planetary magnetic fields are, let us first understand the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, before understanding the Earth's magnetic field, first we have to know like, how do we know that there is a magnetic field? Obviously, uh, we are taught this in uh, our classes, but can we demonstrate that Earth has a magnetic field by something very simple? So yes, in fact, all of you uh, have done this or heard this, that if you have a bar magnet and if you suspend it, then uh, it points in the north and south direction. What does it happen? Because there is another magnet which has a south pole close to the north pole of the suspended magnet. Now, if you just replace this magnet by the Earth, this can be explained how we know that Earth has a magnet. So in fact, this is what you do. Uh, if you have a compass, it points in your north to south direction. And the reason for that is the Earth's uh, north magnetic field is actually near the south geographic pole. And the south magnetic uh, pole is near the geographic north pole. So it's inverted. And that's why uh, your bar magnet shows the uh, north pole in the <clears throat> magnetic north direction. So, uh, but this is a very uh, zoomed in view, uh, if you want to say. So why zoomed in? Because here it looks very nice and symmetric. Uh, it's not really the uh, case. As a first approximation, you can uh, approximate the Earth's magnetic field to a dipole or rather a bar magnet. But uh, if you uh, zoom out, you will notice that uh, it is not a, a symmetric magnetic field. On the day side or the side that is facing the sun, it is uh, you know uh, very much compressed. And on the night side, it is much more elongated. Okay? In fact, it extends uh, even beyond the moon's orbit. On the day side, it might be something like uh, uh, six to eight or three di or something like that, or maybe a little more. So why it is extended some, uh, in this fashion? So uh, that we will see briefly uh, in a later uh, slide. Now, <clears throat> wait, uh, how do we know uh, this magnetic field has been originated? So there have been, uh, you know, a lot of uh, modeling work and a uh, lot of uh, indirect observational uh, techniques by using which we know that Earth has a solid inner core which is mainly of iron. Of course, there are uh, there is nickel, cobalt as well uh, in some amounts, but mainly iron. So the core has two parts, which is uh, the inner solid core. And then you have the outer liquid core, which is basically having a differential rotation with respect to the inner core. And that rotation is like very, very slow thing. I mean, you know, I'm forgetting the number, but it is like, uh, uh, it's a very, very slow speed. It's not like, uh, you know, it's rotating very fast. It's a very slow speed. Now, uh, to have a magnetic field, obviously you would require uh, a fluid where you have conduction of, you know, charges. And uh, since we know that Earth has a magnetic field, so obviously there might be, uh, you know, some flow of such charges. So basically uh, the motion of this um, outer liquid core and since it's uh, at a such a high temperature, it's uh, in the liquid form. So the charges that you have, uh, they uh, get you know, they get arranged in such uh, uh, cylindrical kind of uh, uh, a cylindrical kind of pipes uh, uh, in simple terms uh, you, you can say. And uh, this is where you have motion of uh, these charges, which generates the current. 
and this is not a very steady thing so that also changes so this changing uh, current that also generates a magnetic field which again gives rise to uh, this current then you have the rotation effect of the earth itself so basically all this gives rise to a very complicated uh, magnetic field which uh, if you see inside the earth would uh, look something like this this is basically a computer simulation and outside uh, the earth or uh, rather outside the core uh, you have this uh, sort of dipolar field so this is how uh, it is generated. And the, uh, this field is called as uh, the dynamo uh, or geodynamo. Uh, so if you are interested in you know, pursuing this uh, in future. Now, if you see, uh, although the size wise, it might look like a, a very huge magnet, but this is not a very strong magnetic field. In fact, uh, the Earth's magnetic field is rather weak. And if you have a very strong, uh, uh, magnet uh, of fridge magnet, uh, probably that will have a stronger magnetic field as compared to the earth. But even this magnetic field is quite important. And if you see the intensity map uh, on the earth, uh, the highest points are closer to no the northern coast of Canada, uh, Siberia, and then southern coast of Australia. And the weakest, uh, although we would expect it uh, in the symmetric case to be somewhere in between uh, uh, where the magnetic equator may lie. But actually, the weakest point is uh, somewhere closer to South America and the South Atlantic region. This is known as the South Atlantic anomaly. So uh, this is not a very uh, symmetric kind of field. And if you uh, see the higher order terms, you'll realize that this is basically a multipolar kind of uh, structure. But uh, the dipolar component is the dominant. And as a first approximation, you can take it to be a dipolar uh, magnetic field. Now, uh, but the internal magnetic field is not the only component as far as the Earth's magnetic field or rather any terrestrial uh, uh, planet's magnetic field is concerned. Uh, there are other, uh, you know, uh, components as well. So for example, the motion of, let me see if this video plays. Okay, there might be some issue. Yeah, so basically this uh, was a video. I don't know uh, why this is not playing. Uh, so basically uh, uh, this shows you uh, the minor magnetic fields that are generated by the motion of the sea water or ocean water. Basically because of the tides, uh, you have motion of the oceanic water, which is basically uh, salt water. So it's a mild conductor and that's why, you know, the motion of uh, this uh, liquid also generates a minor uh, magnetic field. Then you have atmospheric component, which is, uh, uh, which is, which resides in something called as ionosphere. It's a layer of the atmosphere, uh, which uh, extends from around say 50 kilometers uh, from the earth's surface to somewhere around 1000 kilometers. But the current that flows, it's somewhere around 100, 105 kilometers. And it is centered uh, in a very narrow region of something like uh, 10 to 20 kilometers or so. That's where the bulk of the current is. So in very simple terms, how it is generated. So you have uh, uh, solar radiation coming and heating up the atmosphere. And the atmosphere has a lot of uh, uh, charge particle, uh, the atmosphere has a lot of different species. So you have oxygen, you have nitrogen, uh, you have molecular uh, nitrogen, molecular oxygen, and you have hydrogen and helium and all these in very trace amounts. So because of uh, Earth's incoming radiation, uh, it also have the ionizing wavelengths of these uh, species. So these ionizing wavelengths, they ionize uh, these particular particles and based on uh, you know various factors uh, you will not have a very smooth uh, uh, peak or uh, just one single peak you'll have actually multiple peaks uh, in the ionosphere so these regions will indicate like uh, the local densities like over there the densities are higher so uh, for example the, the picture is something like this it, so during the daytime you'll have four layers called F1, F2, E, and D. And during the night, night time, D completely disappears. E also more or less disappears. And the F layer, com, uh, the two F layers combine into one. 
So basically the current that flows is mainly in the E region. And uh, since there is a current, there will be an associated magnetic field of that. So uh, why does this happen? Uh, by the way, uh, this ionosphere is basically uh, also useful for the reflection of uh, you know high frequency and very high frequency radio waves. So uh, your walkie-talkie uh, basically functions uh, uh, due to this, like uh, the reflections uh, through the ionosphere, the uh, pilots and air traffic controllers, uh, they talk through this only. So very high frequency radio waves, which basically uh, bounce off from the ionosphere and the Earth surface. And it can uh, even reach uh, or reach across thousands of uh, kilometers. In fact, uh, the demonstration of this uh, for the first time that was uh, given, it was between Europe and Canada, and that was uh, 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 the person who got Nobel Prize for that. Yeah. So uh, how do these ionospheric currents uh, flow? So for that, you have... Uh, uh, so this side, you have uh, sun, and this B indicates the magnetic field of the earth, uh, which is coming out of uh, the screen. So basically we are looking at the earth uh, from above the North Pole, you can say. And uh, so basically uh, this part has actually rotated, uh, the earth has rotated this way. So this part has faced the day and uh, you are having sunset over here. Whereas this part has come through the night and uh, you have sunrise happening over here. So this day night line is called as terminator. So basically you have dust terminator and dawn terminator. Now, uh, what happens like because of the sun's heating, uh, the atmosphere will expand and uh, you'll have higher temperature uh, uh, over here and lower temperature over here. And the way uh, uh, it happens is that uh, the in the E region, these positive charges, basically the ions, since they are heavy, so they not they do not respond very well to uh, you know uh, uh, they do not respond very well to the magnetic field because they are controlled by the collisions, and uh, whereas the uh, these electrons they are controlled by the magnetic field. So uh, as a result, uh, there is a separation of uh, the charges and you have dust terminator where you'll have mainly the negative charges and the dawn terminator where you'll have positive charges. Effectively, there will be a dawn to dust magnetic field. Okay, And since you have a magnetic field, obviously uh, there will be a current. So this current mainly flows in the E region. And since there is a flowing current, there will be an associated magnetic field. So, if you, uh, although this image is, uh, it's a little poor. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, uh, even this video is not flowing. Uh, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I don't know, uh, there is some issue. When I made the presentation, it was uh, playing uh, properly. So uh, basically what is shown in this video is that uh, wherever you have these uh, you know darker colors uh, the maroon and the red this shows that here you have a uh, higher magnetic field because uh, this is where you have uh, the strongest current now this is at ut2 the universal time at 2 hours so basically uh, the sun is over this region so since the sun is over this region, so you have strongest currents over here. And this video or this animation was <clears throat> basically showing that as your time passes and the sun moves uh, you know, westward, even this peak region of uh, strongest current, this will also keep on shifting. And then uh, 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 the reason why it is very strong, it, it is to, due to the way the magnetic field, uh, the Earth's magnetic field is oriented uh, in this equatorial region. Uh, the geomagnetical uh, equatorial region. And here, the sand colors, they also indicate that this is where uh, you have these two current systems, uh, you know, flowing. Anyway, so uh, I showed you a very simple sort of pictures, but actually there are a lot more components. Uh, and some of them are driven by uh, the tides in the atmosphere because of the sun's heating. 
some um, are due to the way magnetic field uh, is oriented. Some of them are, are from the open field lines uh, near the polar region. So it's a very, very complex picture. I was uh, giving you a very brief overview of uh, uh, some of these components uh, in the ionosphere. Yeah. So uh, then you have uh, magnetospheric currents as well. Now, to know uh, about magnetospheric currents, uh, we'll have to, uh, you know, first, uh, know about sun. So why are we jumping from uh, directly from say earth to sun? So uh, you may have already heard about sunspots and this is how it, it would look if you see them in white light or if you put a, you know, a small neutral density filter on top of a telescope and then look at the sun. By the way, if you ever get to use a telescope or a binocular, never point it at the sun and see through the telescope or binocular unless you have a solar filter, which is specifically made to observe the sun. Otherwise it can damage your eyes within um, a second permanently. It will make you blind. Yeah. So uh, if you observe the sun in uh, H alpha, so H alpha uh, is basically uh, a particular wavelength. H alpha indicates hydrogen alpha line. So uh, if you observe the sun in that, you will see much more interesting features that sun is not a very boring or bland uh, thing. Uh, it's uh, much more active. And uh, the sunspot would appear something like this. Uh, this is not the same picture uh, as this one in H alpha. It's a different H alpha image of a different time. So this dark spot is a sun. And then these uh, dark wavy line kind of things that you see all around. Uh, these are uh, plasma features uh, which are rising from the sun's surface and uh, then back. Uh, they are falling back on the surface of the sun. So these are called as filaments or these are called as loops. And these uh, uh, white uh, regions around the sunspot, these are called as active regions and, and uh, plages. So this is where uh, you have a lot of interesting phenomena taking place. So let I have a couple more uh, videos uh, after this. Let, let us see if that plays. Uh, if not, then, uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. So let me let me just stop sh uh, sharing it once and let me try it again. Uh, because when I made the presentation, uh, the video was playing properly. Hang on a second. I think it should work now. Oh, let me let me just quickly show you the previous video as well then. If it let me see if it works. Oh yeah. So this was this was the uh, you know oceanic uh, component uh, due to the motion of the salt water or the tides uh, that you get of the magnetic field. And uh, yeah, so as I was saying that as the sun moves westward, uh, you will have the stronger currents also moving with the sun because essentially it is due to the heating of the atmosphere uh, of the sun. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Let Can us I ask quickly... now or uh, later? Uh, there are questions. No, I have. Huh, I have a question. So can okay. I ask now or later? Oh, uh, okay, fine. We can, you can. So uh, if you go to the earlier also. slide that you were mm -hmm. showing, earlier slide. Okay. Go to earlier slide. Okay, let me go back. Yes, this one, this one, this one, this this okay. video. Ionospheric currents that video yeah. you were showing. Yes. So as the time changes, uh, is this a charge density which is moving or what? Uh, what is shown uh, the it's, color. it's basically the ionospheric currents the intensity of the ionospheric currents and because of uh, the intensity the daily component of the magnetic field that will be changing so, so how does uh, one... the numbers here represent the magnetic field but that magnetic field is uh, because of uh, the ionospheric currents uh, that are flowing 
Okay, so th this is measured from space. Uh, no, this so you have ground-based observatories as well, and you have uh, space-based uh, satellites as well, which can measure this. Okay, so uh, and so uh, for can... example, uh, uh, you may have heard this Kolaba Alibag Magnetic Observatory, right? That is operated by IAG. Huh. So, yeah. so what are the kind of uh, the the magnitudes of these currents, so you can, uh, okay. or or the magnetic field? Uh, the change uh, so, in the field and so on. Okay. So the overall magnetic field strength of the Earth, the uh, internal magnetic field, or the overall intensities uh, near the poles is closer to 60,000 nano Tesla. Okay. And the daily variations uh, that happen because of the ionospheric uh, currents, uh, it can be uh, less than a percent of that. So, uh, like uh, here uh, near the equator, this is called as equatorial electrojet, and this is where you have the strongest currents, and that can be somewhere around uh, uh, 200 to 300 nano tesla at the maximum. So, th this is also not uh, uniform throughout the Earth. At certain places, it will be stronger. At certain places, it will be weaker uh, because of various factors. And uh, at, as you uh, go. Uh, Further away from the equator, uh, this current, uh, 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 the strength of this current will go on decreasing. So, uh, like for example, here, uh, if you see, so the maroon one is uh, closer to probably around 150 or so, or maybe uh, a little more than that. Uh, that's what the scale shows. And uh, uh, this cyan region is somewhere around minus 50. So, this mi minus is because this is basically showing the horizontal component. and the way uh, uh, it is, like for example, at lower latitude, uh, the magnetic field's direction as seen from the ground is same as the direction of the Earth's internal magnetic field. So basically you have uh, added magnetic field. Whereas if you go uh, above or uh, you know further north or south of these focus regions, uh, you have uh, the magnetic field uh, moving in opposite, uh, uh, the current moving in opposite direction. Uh, instead of eastward, you have westward uh, magnetic field. So as a result, that uh, uh, instead of eastward, you have westward currents. So the magnetic field that is generated, it's opposite. So basically, instead of additions, you get subtractions. And that's why you have dip uh, in the magnetic fields over there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, shall we go ahead, or uh, are there other questions? Uh, right now, no questions in the chat. OK. Yeah, so uh, this is a very nice uh, video uh, by uh, NASA. Let me just see if I can share the uh, audio uh, as well. While screen sharing, you may have to choose that option. So. We may yeah. you know, oh, okay, stop okay. sharing and then yeah. choose that option. Okay, let me let me then try again. Oh yeah, share sound. Thank you.
this white circle indicates the size of the sun and this star for this that we see is called as a corona this is from another satellite the cme is basically corona so why i was uh, suddenly talking about the sun uh, you know when we were discussing the earth's magnetic field uh, that is because uh, whatever happens on the sun it greatly affects uh, the near earth space environment of the earth and uh, it can produce uh, something very beautiful uh, as uh, we will see uh, by the way this is just a comparison of uh, one of uh, uh, the flares with the size of the uh, earth itself uh, you can see so you can probably add, fit as many as say 10 15 hours uh, within these uh, loops that occur on the sun yeah so uh, there is something called a space weather just as you have weather on earth uh, because of the solar activities and uh, the phenomena on sun uh, the outer uh, you know uh, space or the near earth space that can uh, have uh, a lot of effects uh, due to these activities and uh, it's important to study that because you have uh, so many satellites uh, in space, you have astronauts in space, and whatever uh, these phenomena are and uh, the way they interact with the Earth's uh, magnetic field, it can cause the harmful effects uh, and it can have a significant economic impact. So as uh, we are becoming more and more technology dependent, it's very important to study that. So this field is known as space weather and it's a very uh, promising and upcoming sort of field. So I have another video over here. Uh, this is by the University of uh, Oslo, uh, which basically uh, shows uh, how the auroras are formed. So let, let me just play this. It seems that I'll have to stop and share again. Very sorry about that. Because that's a very nice video. And uh, because I had a nice video, so I didn't put uh, a lot of images of uh, uh, Aurora. So uh, the video is really important for the explanation. Let me just uh, try again. Strong magnetic fields push their way up through the surface. They slow down the eddies of hot gas. The surface cools and darker sunspots appear. The electrically charged gas is called plasma. The plasma drags the magnetic field further outwards. The magnetic field stretches and twists like a rubber band. And then the rubber band breaks. So Several this, uh, billion tons, tons of plasma is hurled out from the sun. This is called a solar storm. The solar storm can reach speeds over 8 million kilometers an hour. After six hours, it blows past the planet Mercury. After 12 hours, the planet Venus. With Mercury and Venus, we are not seeing any interesting interaction because they do not have magnetic field. hours the solar storm reaches earth when the solar storm reaches our planet something strange happens an invisible shield 
the Earth's magnetic field deflects the storm. The magnetic fields couple together and create a funnel for the gas streams down on the daylight side of the pole. This is the daylight aurora. The magnetic fields stretch further back and couple together. The magnetic rubber band breaks. Gas from the solar storm streams along the magnetic lines towards the poles on the night side. This is the nighttime aurora. This is the nighttime aurora. Streams along the magnetic. Yeah. So what you are seeing here is that uh, on the day side, uh, when the magnetic reconnection happens, uh, some of the energy transfer and the particles uh, transfer will happen. So, but that uh, magnetic reconnection is only possible when you have the orientation of the magnetic field in the plasma cloud or the CME cloud opposite to the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. So that's why this uh, this is an additional condition. So for example, if it has the same orientation as the Earth's magnetic field, then you won't have the reconnection and the energy transfer won't be as much. And uh, the effect will not be very severe. Whereas on the night side, uh, the way the magnetic field is oriented because it is stressed uh, uh, a lot, so the orientation of the magnetic field lines is, uh, you know, almost uh, horizontal in this part. And that's where, uh, you know, the magnetic uh, reconnection uh, always takes place. And that's from there, you can have uh, a lot of dumping of these charged particles, and then they will be accelerated along the magnetic field line. So these charged particles are basically electrons and protons that are emitted from the sun. Strong magnetic aurora. Yeah. The magnetic fields stretch further back and couple together. The magnetic rubber band breaks, and gas from the solar storm streams along the magnetic lines towards the poles on the night side. This is the nighttime aurora. So this region is called as auroral oval. It is just below the polar region, the, below the magnetic poles. This is how it looks. So these emissions, the green emissions, is mainly uh, because of the uh, oxygen uh, lines. The green and the red are both are because of the oxygen lines. Uh, the blue or violet ones can be because of the nitrogen. Yeah, so I mean, this looks very beautiful. And uh, uh, although it is mainly seen uh, at higher latitudes, uh, uh, but sometimes, depending upon the severity of uh, the event, it the aurora can even come down to further uh, lower and lower latitudes. Uh, the example of that was, uh, one such example was in uh, April this year, when uh, aurora was uh, seen from Ladakh as well. So just see this time-lapse video and try to focus over here. Yeah, so the, if you see this reddish, reddish color uh, at the top. So uh, I would like to clarify something here is that Aurora was not seen over Ladakh. It was seen from Ladakh. Okay, what do I mean by that? So basically the image that you saw over here, this time-lapse video, this is uh, from something called as an all-sky camera. Uh, so the camera has a fisheye lens uh, on the top of it and it can give you a field of view of nearly 180 degrees. So uh, if you see something, you know, uh, at the edge of this uh, uh, this field of view here in the north, uh, basically it means that it is uh, uh, further to the north of Ladakh. So uh, yeah, so here this is one such image. So this was uh, seen overhead till I think uh, 44 or 46 degree latitude. Uh, Ladakh is somewhere, um, I think, 32 degrees or so. So yeah, 40, 44 or 45 degree uh, latitude, northern latitude, uh, that's where it was seen overhead. So usually 44 to uh, 45 means it, it is almost like the um, central to southern Europe uh, in that region. Uh, it was visible or 
closer to southern europe but uh, something interesting like this has happened or rather way more interesting has happened in the past also so uh, when i said that severity of these events so uh, depending upon how how much amount of plasma has been emitted with what velocity what kind of uh, pressure is over there what kind of velocity is there of the plasma cloud so depending upon various condition and the way uh, the orientation of the magnetic field is and within how much short time uh, it impacts the earth and at what angle uh, it impacts the earth uh, the effect can be more or less severe so uh, the strongest event that has occurred uh, till now was in 1859 and uh, that is known as carrington event and at that time in india we had you know completely overcast skies so there was monsoon period so aurora would not have been seen in india at that time but uh, a little less severe uh, event happened in 1872 in february and this clipping uh, or rather this uh, uh, this write up is basically from times of india um, uh, of uh, february 6 so you can see that it states uh, will it surprise our readers to learn that aurora was uh, plainly visible in bombay on last sunday such uh, in the uh, such was indeed the case and its effects were felt too after sunday uh, aurora on sunday uh, after the sunset on sunday the aurora was slightly visible and constantly kept changing color becoming deeply violet when it was intense about 3 o'clock on monday morning it was distinctly visible until sunrise on monday influence of this atmospheric disturbance was unpleasant uh, both for our person and uh, our correspondents so uh, the cold was unpleasant to keen, uh, keen and telegraphic communication was stopped for some time so the cold part is not related uh, but all telegraphic communication was stopped for some hours so the reason for that is that uh, when this aurora has happened and uh, at that time preceding that you have a very very strong current uh, which flows in the magnetosphere and that current is much much stronger as compared to the currents that flow in the ionosphere the effect of that is that uh, the overall magnetic field can uh, you know decrease for a bit and uh, after the decrease uh, it will uh, you know uh, uh, it, it will take some uh, few hours maybe half a day or closer to a day to recover back so uh, yeah that's what uh, uh, happened uh, in uh, february Uh, four five in eighteen seventy two, and uh, Aurora was visible in Mumbai. So this is very nice, right? Uh, that that's what we would like to think. But thankfully, at that time, the whole technology that uh, uh, we possessed or or the humans possessed uh, was mainly telegraph lines, and that's it. Whereas uh, in modern age, we have uh, satellite, mobile phone, power grids, things like that. which can be greatly impacted by uh, the effects um, of uh, uh, activities on the sun so uh, basically it can cause disturbances in the ionosphere changes in the uh, the electron density in the ionosphere so basically when you get reflection from uh, any uh, ionospheric layer it happens when your uh, your radio signals frequency matches with the plasma frequency of the ionosphere so the ionization is changed that frequency also will change and uh, where you were getting regular reflections that also will completely change uh, you may get reflection at some different place or your signal may be even absorbed then uh, whenever these currents are generated they are quite strong so they can generate induced currents uh, in you know uh, power grids it can overpower the transmission lines so just like your Uh, fuse blows in any electrical appliance your p- p- power grid uh, uh, power grid's capacity the current carrying capacity uh, will be uh, you know uh, overshot and the kind of current that is generated it can completely uh, destroy the transformer or it can damage the power lines so you can have power blackouts uh, which can last from few hours to few days and if it is a particularly severe event uh, like a carrington event it can be easily uh, in few weeks to few months the economic impact it may cause uh, it can go 4 to 10 billion dollars or probably even more than that if it is a, a, that severe event so although uh, carrington event happened in 1859 something like that happened in 2012 again but fortunately the way we were in, in our orbit this plasma cloud had uh, skipped the earth 
So uh, we were saved by a chance. That's it. Okay. Uh, then the last part is the crustal magnetic field. Now, this is uh, almost going into uh, the geology aspects, and I am not an expert on that. My area was space physics. So uh, I'll just briefly touch upon this uh, because I myself don't know much about that. So basically, crustal magnetic field uh, tells you the magnetic field uh, uh, that's there in the rocks or the surface of the Earth or the crust of the Earth. So as you can see that uh, this is a anomaly map. So it shows that although uh, the quality is a little uh, poor uh, in these images, but uh, here these variations, they basically indicate uh, like regions where you have you know, a little stronger magnetic field and the regions where you'll have uh, a little weaker magnetic field. So these kind of variations, these are, uh, they may be because of the compositions of the rocks or uh, so you may have some rocks which are a little more magnetic, some minerals which are less magnetic. So uh, you'll have variations and then uh, internally also the way the uh, the structure of the rock is the, the, on the surface you make it you may get different uh, values for these magnetic fields but these things are not stationary and if you see the magnetic field on a sufficiently large scale of time you will notice that uh, it changes it's not a fixed thing so for example if you see the location of the magnetic uh, pole near the the north geographic pole so basically uh, the southern uh, magnetic pole. So uh, here it plots its position from 1590 to somewhere around uh, 2020. So uh, you can see that over the period of time, uh, it is changing. So by a coincidence, earlier uh, this movement was lower and in the recent years, it has been uh, a, a little faster. So uh, it indicates that the magnetic field is not phased and if you have a very, very high, sufficiently long period of time, you will notice quite significant differences. So uh, although this change is very little, but you can have periods where the entire magnetic field will reverse. So uh, for example, this is just an illustration. Uh, it indicates like you will have periods where the magnetic field uh, will be in one direction. Then you'll have certain periods where the magnetic field will be completely reversed and then so on. So these basically different colored uh, uh, bands in this, uh, in this rock structure or in this crust structure indicates different orientation of the magnetic field. So it why is, does it happen and how oh, do we know is. this? So basically, when you have uh, the movement of these uh, tectonic plates, you will have regions where newer rocks will be formed. Or uh, if you have volcanic activity uh, as the uh, lava uh, cools down, uh, basically it will start solidifying. So when it is in molten state, the temperature is quite high and the uh, the magnetic field, the remnant magnetic field in that will be oriented as in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field, which is present at that time. But once it solidifies, okay, it cools down sufficiently, it solidifies, that magnetic field will be locked in that rock sample. And uh, over, say, tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years, if your magnetic field uh, changes again, then by using the older rock or the older rock sample, you can understand, OK, what would have been the strength as well as the orientation of the magnetic field at that particular uh, period of time. So this is how uh, this field is known as paleomagnetism. And uh, there are people who you know, uh, use these rock samples to understand the history of the magnetic field uh, of the Earth. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, just to indicate like, uh, you know, uh, where these kind of uh, faults are. So basically, uh, the, uh, this fault that you see here, you don't uh, see the movement of plates away from each other. They just move sideways. So uh, this is a different type of fault, but uh, uh, I just gave this as an example because uh, one of the very famous subsurface uh, or uh, you know oceanic uh, uh, faults uh, that's there it's in atlantic oceans and you cannot have an underwater photo of that so yeah that that's the reason why i put uh, this fault which is there in california so uh, this is all regarding the earth's magnetic field i have just a couple of slides for the magnetic fields of uh, other planets so for example mars has a uh, it does not have a global magnetic field it has a crustal magnetic field so if you see uh, the Martian surface, uh, 
you don't see any north to south pole uh, like you see uh, or north to south or south to north global field as you have in the case of uh, the earth here you don't see any pole over here whereas over here uh, you see some sort of a magnetic field so this is basically of crustal origin only so southern uh, magnetic field of uh, Mars, you can say, or Southern Pole, you, you can say if you want to say, but this is not actually a uh, pole as in the sense of a bipolar magnetic field. This is basically the crystal magnetic field, which is just connected to the magnetic field of the interplanetary medium, which is basically just the extension of uh, sun's magnetic field in the entire solar system. Now, uh, why this is important? So you may hear uh, nowadays, you know, that you know, everyone is trying to colonize Mars. Uh, Elon Musk is planning to go to Mars, or he wants to uh, take a bunch of people with him and uh, settle down on Mars. But uh, this absence of a global magnetic field is a significant challenge uh, as far as uh, colonization of Mars is concerned. Why? Because uh, whatever you just saw, what I explained earlier, this magnetic, this kind of a global magnetic field, it's very important for uh, us to protect from the harmful radiation, uh, the charged particles that are coming from the sun. So in the absence of these charged particles, uh, in the absence of this magnetic field, the charged particles from the sun, they can come and directly impact, or the plasma cloud can directly come and impact uh, uh, very close to uh, the surface of uh, the planet. So in fact, uh, and the size of Mars is uh, smaller, much significantly smaller than Earth. So as a result of that, the gravity is also significantly weaker. So as a result of that, since the gravity is weaker, so the Mars is not holding on to its atmosphere very uh, strongly. So when these uh, uh, charged particles and the plasma cloud is coming from the sun, it is uh, interacting with that Martian atmosphere and it is peeling away the uh, atmosphere slowly over a period of time. And whenever you have very strong uh, uh, space weather events, uh, very strong coronal mass ejections, it can, uh, you know, peel away uh, the atmosphere in a much more significant manner. So, in fact, this is the reason why Mars is losing its atmosphere over a period of time. So, as it is, the Martian atmosphere is not very uh, dense. So, and this peeling away because of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, because of the interaction with uh, the solar emissions, uh, this is one very great challenge as far as the, the colonization of uh, Mars uh, is concerned in future. I mean, there are various ideas and various technologies that people will employ in future. Uh, one of the simplest would be, uh, you know, just to have uh, an underground settlement, uh, which and the ground itself will protect you uh, from uh, these uh, charged particles then. But then this is an additional challenge. Uh, that one needs to keep in mind uh, if we want to, you know, uh, colonize uh, Mars. And these kind of challenges are also there, of course, uh, in the case of Moon also, uh, because uh, here uh, at least you have uh, a little bit strong crustal magnetic field. In the case of Moon, you don't have even that. Uh, and again, if you want to colonize Moon and uh, stay there for a substantially long period of time, uh, probably humans will have to, you know, settle in the lava tubes uh, which are there uh, below the surface of uh, the Moon. Uh, there are so this questions. is as far as uh, uh, any uh, terrestrial planet is concerned uh, in the solar system. I already told you uh, in the earlier video that Mars and uh, Venus do not have it. Uh, so, but what about uh, the gas? Giant? Yeah, this is just a crystal magnetic field map. It just shows you the magnetic field uh, strength in nano Tesla. Uh, the red ones are a little stronger regions and. Uh, the blue ones um, are uh, negative regions. So here you can see that in, near the southern pole uh, or in the southern polar region, it is uh, much stronger. Sir, there are two questions. Yeah. So, uh, uh, hello. Sorry. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Uh, there, are, there are questions in the chat. So, mm -hmm. uh, one was about uh, why that magnetic field reversal happens. Uh, okay. But partly you answered that. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, then there is a question uh, does it mean that gravity does affect magnetic field lines of any planet there is a... uh, uh, I am probably uh, not qualified to answer that question uh, my guess is that the gravity plays <clears throat> a role 
as far as uh, uh, as far as the crystal magnetic field may be concerned okay uh, because uh, when the surface is forming uh, depending upon uh, the way material is sinking within the surface or uh, uh, the way uh, this molten rocks are moving or the way uh, the mantle is moving uh, that can have uh, certain certain effects as far as the, the crustal magnetic field is concerned uh, what can affect the magnetic field as well as the gravity both is the actual size of the planet itself so i mean depending upon the size of the planet and the mass of the planet the, the gravity uh, will be affected and by that extension yes the way the magnetic field is even that may be uh, affected but ultimately it comes down to uh, as far as the global magnetic field is concerned it, it turns out to be uh, like in, as in the case of um, the earth is the motion of the outer liquid core so basically you need to have a, a way uh, in which you have a flow of charges so in the case of earth it is the motion of uh, this uh, outer liquid core in the case of outer planets as i am showing on uh, this slide uh, so you do not have a, a solid surface as in the case of terrestrial planets but uh, uh, the kind of mass these planets uh, possess uh, as you approach the center of these planets the densities become so high that uh, the material behaves in a much more different kind of manner so for example jupiter saturn they uh, their core is mainly made up of hydrogen but this is uh, the kind of extreme temperatures and pressures uh, are exerted on this core uh, the way it behaves it is called as a metallic hydrogen so basically uh, uh, it it forms a conducting substance so and that's that's what the motion of that is giving uh, the origin to the magnetospheres of these planets so for example here if you see the uh, jupiter's magnetic field this is very strong in fact uh, it extends so far out that saturn is actually inside the magnetic field of jupiter and uh, the interaction of the jupiter's magnetic field with the magnetic field of the saturn it gives uh, rise to even more interesting uh, phenomena uh, here you have uh, the size of sun uh, uh, comparing uh, uh, compared with the magnetospheres of these planets so this just gives you an idea like how huge and strong these uh, you know uh, magnetospheres are so uh, i do not uh, have uh, too many slides about this because i wanted to give enough time for any questions uh, uh, that might be there so uh, I, before uh, we just go on to question answer i just have uh, one more interesting yeah, there, slide there is another so, question yes uh, the question uh, no i wanted to ask uh, was with a comment first because uh, no it doesn't seem that we have a final theory of how magnetic field is generated because true, uh, true. because though magnetic field reversal happens you don't observe planet rotating in opposite direction i mean planets are not changing right, their right. direction but magnetic field is right. reversing so uh, right. it is not straight away connection between uh, the internal liquid is moving in one direction and therefore magnetic field is uh, generated right, right. True. Uh, true now the question is when you talked about uh, that there can be in case of mars for example uh, you know colonization of mars uh, you said mm -hmm. you showed a concern that uh, because magnetic field is not there or you know local magnetic field is there but global field is not there uh, right. there can be problem because uh, that's what the main theme is that they are guardians of planets magnetic fields so right. question is in case of earth the magnetic field right. reversals have taken place in the past right. and right. Uh, the re field reversal can actually take place in two ways either the field remains the same but uh, the magnetic pole rotates uh, mm -hmm. but the other way is magnetic field may go on reducing and uh, then change the direction right so uh, it seems that magnetic field has reduced and changed the direction uh, in case of earth right. so in that case right surely there were periods when magnetic field was very very low right and uh, but do they have any kind of correlation with 
say mass extinction or the new species arriving because of mutation those kind of things i mean how how people done any kind of relation or study uh, definitely there will be studies uh, related to that uh, but off the top of my head i uh, cannot say what was the effect at that time because i have not looked uh, too much detailed into that uh, in any recent time uh, okay. as far as the reversal is concerned yeah i had missed uh, answering a part of that uh, it, when i was answering the earlier question so uh, it turns out that uh, the magnetic field reversal is uh, it's just not the case of uh, you know uh, turning it off and then turning on uh, again in the opposite direction and it's uh, not the as, as uh, uh, you have rightly mentioned it's not the case of you know just field uh, the magnetic field rotating and becoming 180 degree flipped uh, what uh, happens is basically the magnetic field uh, although we say it's a dipolar thing but there are many other higher order terms okay so uh, there there are higher order harmonics so if you write uh, the magnetic field strength in an equation it will have uh, many bunch of uh, um, order of terms uh, with different coefficients. So it so happens that during the magnetic field, and at least that's what uh, I have come across in whatever references I used, is that when you have magnetic field uh, reversal, basically the dipolar component reduces and the multipolar components or uh, the harmonics increase. So uh, instead of a, a nice, strong dipolar global field, you will have small, small multipolar fields spread throughout the surface of the Earth. And then over a period of time, they will uh, again give rise to a dipolar field. How does that happen? Uh, I don't know. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if anyone knows that. But the observations uh, or the hypotheses that have been proposed uh, indicate that. That, uh, you know, from dipolar, it becomes a multipolar, and then again, it becomes a dipolar thing. There is one more question. Yeah. Uh, tectonically inactive planets uh, do have or can have stable magnetic fields. So is it only a matter of our current understanding, or is it that the planetary magnetosphere is somewhat mass dependent as far as gravitational field is? Uh, uh, see, it's not purely mass dependent, because if you see... Uh, Venus and Earth have uh, quite similar mass, but Venus uh, does not have a uh, global magnetic field. Uh, so it, it is just not uh, purely the question of uh, you know uh, uh, mass. It's it's the question of whether there is a flow of uh, uh, you know uh, any conducting sort of material. So at least that's what our present understanding of uh, you know a dynamo is uh, in the case of a planetary magnetic field. So uh, with that understanding, we understand that uh, uh, Venus does not have uh, a liquid outer core, and that's why it does not have a, a global magnetic field like Earth. Whereas in the case of Earth, since you have a liquid outer core and you have flow of uh, charges, that's where uh, you get uh, this global magnetic field. But as uh, uh, you had just mentioned, uh, that is not a very well settled thing. This is our just present understanding, which answers some questions, but probably there are many more questions still to be answered. Thank you, sir. Okay, I just have uh, one more slide uh, after this. Yeah, so uh, uh, we just saw that, you know, Jupiter uh, has a very, very strong magnetic field. So uh, on Jupiter also, you have uh, Aurora. Uh, but it is in ultraviolet. And uh, in fact, this is an observation of uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, what you are seeing here, this is basically the this aurora is superimposed on the optical image of Jupiter. But uh, the aurora observations are in ultraviolet because uh, Hubble uh, Telescope can also observe uh, in ultraviolet in certain bands. So yeah, that's what uh, you are seeing here. And uh, again, uh, the interaction is similar as in the case of Sun and Earth. Uh, but uh, uh, in the case of Earth, when these charged particles, uh, they interact with the atmospheric species in our atmosphere and transfer their energy. By absorbing that energy, uh, the atmospheric species in our atmosphere, they get excited. They cannot remain there. They de-excite. And when they get de-excited, they release these uh, 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 electromagnetic radiation, which turns out to be in uh, optical band, uh, the green line, uh, which is... Uh, uh, 6,300 uh, angstroms and uh, or rather the red line is 6,300 angstroms and the green line is 
5,557 angstroms. And there, there are a bunch more uh, lines. But the, these are the two pr prominent ones. Whereas in the case of uh, uh, Jupiter, these are in ultraviolet. So uh, yeah, that's where I would like to stop. These are uh, some of the places where I took the images from and uh, some of these uh, simulations and the videos. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's where we stopped. Uh, and if there are more questions and interactions or anything on this, uh, I would love to answer. I see that there are some in chat. Uh, uh, I think, yeah, this is the same question that uh, tectonically inactive planets do have, can have stable magnetic fields. So is it only a matter of our understanding that uh, is it the planetary magnetosphere is somewhat mass dependent? Okay. So the mass dependent thing, uh, uh, I think we already discussed. Uh, this uh, tectonically inactive planets, can they have magnetic field? Uh, I mean, in the case of Mars, we have seen that there is a uh, uh, magnetic field, but that is of crustal origin. So, from crustal uh, uh, effects or the you know crustal component, yes, that magnetic field can be there. But I'm not sure if it can have a, a global magnetic field because if you have uh, a molten uh, material, uh, like for example, in the case of uh, Earth, you have uh, liquid outer core, and the kind of temperatures there are in the size of the Earth, the you still have the mantle because of which you have the tectonic activity. Uh, in the case of uh, planets which are too small or uh, in the case of Venus, which is similar, it does not have uh, that kind of motion. And that's why probably you do not have uh, tectonic plates either. So I'm not sure if we can have uh, uh, both. So can we can we say that, uh, you know, that um, gravity, high gravity and also high magnetic field is like a mm -hmm. correlation, but it is not causation. So as you mentioned that, you know, a large yes, mass yes. would also mean that probably large amount of radioactive material, which will keep the interior hot. Right, therefore, right. Correct. Uh, you know, that kind of thing can be said. Right, right. There's one uh, more there's thing. A yeah. uh, yes, uh, you are saying. One more thing in the chat. The sun also have magnetic field to protect us from cosmic radiations. So that helio. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, before force. that, there is just a comment that reversal are uh, not sudden, but take large time to take place. Yes, of course. Uh, I was talking in the terms of geological time scales. In geological time scales, uh, when you see that, uh, uh, you will say that they are kind of sudden because they will happen over a, a few tens of thousand years uh, at the most. Uh, but yeah, if you see the human lifetime it, or uh, 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 the technological uh, technological progress or the observational uh, data that we have in that sense uh, it does take a very long time because i was just talking in the relative sense uh, of the planetary history basically uh, okay so does sun also have a magnetic field to protect us from the cosmic radiation so yes uh, uh, there is something called as heliosphere uh, which uh, uh, so basically the entire system Solar system is within the heliosphere, the magnetic field of the sun, which uh, you know uh, spreads out. So it does uh, protect us uh, from uh, some of the cosmic radiation. But some of the cosmic rays uh, that come, they uh, have a very very high energy. So sun's magnetic field uh, cannot do much over there. And then uh, although the sun's magnetic field protect us, uh, uh, it it is it is somewhat also the cause of the space weather events that happen because uh, the plasma cloud that is emitted from the sun, uh, the coronal mass ejections. So because of the high temperatures uh, uh, that's there, so uh, uh, we call it that there is a frozen in condition. That means that magnetic field is frozen in the plasma. You cannot separate the two. It would be uh, uh, like uh, if you uh, just uh, cook Maggie and then, uh, you know, pick up one noodle, you have this soup 
dripping off it. So uh, you can imagine uh, that to be the scenario that magnetic field and uh, this plasma, can, it cannot be separated in the case of solar plasma. So whenever you have this emission of the plasma cloud, uh, the magnetic field is embedded in that. And the, depending upon the orientation of that magnetic field, we can have the interaction with that plasma cloud and we can have severe or less severe uh, space weather event. Okay, uh, there are uh, there is a question on the liquid mirror telescope. Okay, so uh, the mirror is the, the, the probably the most expensive component of any telescope. And uh, astronomers are always interested in making bigger and bigger telescope because bigger the mirror, uh, larger is the amount of uh, light collected. And as a result of that, brighter uh, will be the images that are produced. In addition to that, a larger mirror also gives you a better resolving power. That means you start observing finer and finer details in the uh, target that you are observing. So uh, you are always interested in, in making bigger telescope, but then these are very special type of, uh, 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 made up of very special type of glass, uh, which has very low thermal expansion uh, uh, with changes in the temperature because otherwise your optical alignment will be disturbed. So uh, what you do, uh, you have very few places where these uh, these type of mirrors can be made. And then you have to transport them to very remote locations on top of a mountain. So it's very, very challenging. Uh, like uh, the mirror in the 3.6 meter telescope, it weighs 4.3 ton. Uh, the largest uh, telescope using single mirror, it's around 8.4 meter, which will be definitely something like 20 ton or something like that. So it becomes very challenging if you have to uh, you know, take huge mirrors. So uh, there are two workarounds. So one of the workarounds uh, that has been used, they make the mirrors in multiple segments uh, using the segmented mirror technology. So the largest uh, telescopes at present, which are of 10 meter size, they use that. Similarly, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope also uses segmented mirror. The other workaround is uh, using liquid mirror telescope. Now here with liquid mirror, what uh, you need to do, you just have to carry some liquid mercury in part by part, and then uh, you have to pour it in a container and then just rotate that. So as a result, you'll have a much larger mirror. But uh, since it's liquid, you can't really point in any direction. The glass mirror uh, telescopes, they can be moved around and they can be pointed uh, to any particular target and they can track that object for a long time and you can do much more detailed observation of that particular target. Whereas liquid mirror telescopes, these are uh, uh, a novel uh, idea, you can say. Uh, there have been very few liquid mirror telescopes uh, till now, and uh, most were either for technology demonstration or for space debris tracking. Uh, in fact, the liquid mirror telescope at Davis, this is the first one which is located at a sufficiently uh, you know, dark sky uh, for doing astronomy. So this is the world's first uh, liquid mirror telescope which is being used for uh, as, uh, astronomical studies. So since you can't move it in any direction, the telescope will continuously observe uh, uh, overhead uh, towards the zenith. But because of the Earth's rotation, a narrow strip of the sky will keep on passing in front of it. So it will continuously observe and take a lot of images of that narrow strip of the sky. And night after night, uh, these images will be just uh, you know taken and they will be compared uh, to find if you see something new. So sometimes it can be something very boring like an airplane or a passing satellite. It can be mildly interesting like a defunct satellite or a space debris or a near uh, or space asteroid or a small asteroid. Sometimes it can be much more interesting, something like an exploding star or a supernova. So in fact, uh, the liquid mirror telescope has already discovered a supernova like that. So these are going to be uh, used for survey kind of studies. And uh, the people who have uh, you know, come up with uh, these kind of uh, technologies, like uh, it is thought that maybe in sometime in the future when we have a colonized moon, at least for astronomical studies or for scientific studies, the craters of moon uh, can serve as a place for much larger liquid mirror telescope, which can have a diameter of say 100 meter or 200 meter. Okay, uh, two magnetic field lines of Earth regrow on the day side after interaction with the solar storm. Uh, I mean, uh, you can't uh, think of magnetic field lines as uh, a physical entity, like say a rubber band or a branch of uh, 
a uh, tree that uh, you know it gets chopped on and it or it breaks off it is not that way it is for our understanding so there is nothing physically breaking it is just the way uh, the magnetic fields uh, interact so from the day side it gets dragged on the way, uh, reason why it is compressed on the day side is because of the solar radiation and the solar wind and uh, that dragging on that you are seeing uh, when the magnetic field lines snaps off and it gets uh, stretched on the night side it is just the way it interacts with the magnetic field in that plasma cloud it is uh, it is not something actual uh, physical thing breaking you cannot uh, uh, you not know, take the magnetic field lines like that okay as we were talking about magnetic field reversal where global magnetic field uh, converts into localized and also bad we get global magnetic field can we compare the concept with mars because we can see localized magnetic field on mars now uh, is magnetic field reversal taking place on mars uh, it's a very good and interesting question but i don't think that is the case because we don't see that uh, localized magnetic field everywhere on mars it is just in that place we are seeing but as we do more and more studies and uh, as we'll start uh, you know uh, as the geologists will start seeing martial rock samples and then start analyzing that in future probably we'll have a better answer but as of now we don't think that is the situation uh, which types of liquids are put in the liquid telescopes are they different from uh, for different spectrum telescopes no so as of now for liquid uh, mirror telescope we just have optical telescopes which use mercury uh, because mercury remains liquid even at uh, little sub zero temperatures that one can encounter at very high altitude sites uh, gallium also is sufficiently reflective uh, and uh, in liquid form but it is a liquid form at a little higher temperature uh, i think uh, the melting point uh, is somewhere in 20 degrees or something like that i do not remember the exact value but uh, at the kind of heights or altitudes where these telescopes are installed uh, in the winter or during the night the temperatures can go below zero so you cannot use gallium and that is the reason why mercury is used okay uh, do you have any youtube channel or uh, where such topics are concerned unfortunately no i am not a youtube star uh, aries has a youtube channel where uh, we can have some of these topics covered and uh, some of the scientific seminars and you know um, the telescopes of aries are covered but you have so many different uh, youtube uh, sources uh, like for example from nasa or or from uh, other respectable educational uh, uh, content creators uh, like there is uh, someone called as uh, physics girl or smarter every day so th these are some of the famous ones uh, which you can use to you know understand more in detail but you have to be careful you have to uh, be sure that the source you are using it is uh, giving you the right information and it is not just you know some uh, you know lunatic talking about uh, flat earth and things like that uh, can you tell about upcoming solar maximum event okay so if you see uh, the number of spots or uh, on the sun basically the sun spots the number keeps on changing and over a sufficiently long period of time if you see then you'll see that uh, the number of spots uh, are ze even zero sometimes so that is called as solar minimum it will increase for few years something like four years five years it will reach a maximum time so that is called a solar maximum when you can have 150 to 200 250 sunspots so this number has been different in different solar cycles and then for 5 to 6 or 7 years it will fall off so basically the increase is faster the fall off is slower and on an average uh, this period is around 11 years it is not exactly 11 sometimes it can go even 12 12.5 but on an average if you see a lot of uh, solar cycles the average uh, duration that you will get is around um, 11 years so uh, this is basically uh, when you have a lot of uh, sun spots the frequency of uh, solar flares these solar flares are basically just uh, emission of high energy radiation so like x rays and ultraviolet so when you have sudden burst of ultraviolet on x rays that is called as a solar flare and uh, the emission of charged particles to these uh, plasma clouds the coronal mass ejections so the frequency of this is more during solar maximum events the severity of those events also can be more during uh, solar maximum events 
So yeah, that, that's what uh, I don't know if that was uh, uh, that's what you wanted to know if, if there is any specific question among solar maxim. So whenever you have solar maximum condition, uh, basically the space weather events will be a little more severe, and uh, it, it you can imagine that as to be the kind of rough sea uh, event uh, as compared to solar minimum, which can be a calm sea kind of event if you are uh, on a journey uh, on a cruise ship. Just one additional question to that. Yeah. Uh, are there kind of amateur astronomer activities that one can do around this time? Uh, uh, around the sun. So, uh, like, for example, if you continuously observe the sun and uh, uh, like you can monitor the number of spots, although uh, with a smaller telescope, uh, you will only see the larger spots. Uh, but uh, yes, you can. Uh, uh, take the, those the sunspot observations, and if you, uh, I mean, with altazimuth telescope, also it is possible. But if you have an equatorially mounted uh, telescope, and if you take uh, images with the same setup, you can even figure out the rotation of uh, uh, the sun by using those uh, uh, those observations of sunspots and uh, using those images, and. Uh, uh, there is something called as limb darkening effect, uh, which is basically because the way you look at the sun, the central part of the sun, uh, uh, since the way density of any atmosphere functions, is that it falls off as you go up at higher altitude. So if when you are looking something at, uh, at a perpendicular angle, uh, you will encounter the denser part of the atmosphere only uh, uh, for a shorter uh, distance. Whereas uh, if you observe something at a much more shallower angle, the light will be passing through the denser part of the atmosphere for, for much longer duration or a much longer distance. That's why the sun appears uh, you know, uh, uh, much more mild uh, when it is sunrise or sunset as compared to when it is uh, uh, you know, almost like overhead. So uh, something like that also happens with because of the sun's atmosphere itself. And that is the reason why uh, the solar limb, basically the outer edges, they appear darker. So uh, although I have not, not done it myself and I haven't read much about it, but uh, there are ways you can uh, you know measure that effect also. Uh, why the strength of uh, magnetic field is in negative powers of Gauss and not in positive powers of Tesla? Because, uh, oh, I, I see that you have already uh, answered. Yeah, that, that's what. Uh, it's a very small value, and that's why nano Tesla is preferred. Are the Aurora lights harmful to human beings? Uh, see, uh, the Aurora that's visible, it is just um, uh, optical light. So Aurora in itself is not harmful. But the reason why auroras are generated, the phenomena which is behind aurora, generating aurora, that can generate a lot of currents in the atmosphere, which can have significant economic impact. And if you are like, for example, flying in a plane, or if you are G using GPS, uh, that can have uh, the technology, uh, technological impacts can be so much that, like for example, the pilot will not be able to communicate with the air traffic controller, or uh, at higher latitudes, you can have power blackouts uh, because of uh, the uh, impact on the power grids. If you are using GPS, the error in the GPS will be much more. So those kind of things can happen. Uh, when the direction of the magnetic field of the Earth changes, then the shape of the magnetic flux lines would change. Could this uh, could this lead to other effects? Like, uh, example, errors may be visible at lower altitudes or high energy charged particles may reach the Earth's surface? Yes, definitely. That's what uh, can happen. Uh, are there any other questions? I I don't see any further comment. Uh, no other chat. questions right now in the chat. Oh, I see that you have already given the link of the YouTube channel. Thank you. So I take uh, this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Virendra Yadav. Thank you, sir. Uh, for giving this uh, information-rich uh, talk. 
and uh, especially uh, you know pitching it at the correct level our undergraduate students and uh, when when the level matches you can see that a lot of interactions happen and that's what you are seeing that so many questions are coming from participants and a lot of questions and uh, as virendra himself said he really loves uh, enjoying uh, enjoys this kind of interactions and i would uh, therefore think that this was one of the very uh, fruitful session for all participants so on behalf of uh, wilson college uh, wilson college physics department the management and uh, the iipt uh, mumbai sub regional council uh, we thank you sir for giving this uh, wonderful uh, time to all our uh, participant students thank you very much uh thank you sir it was my pleasure and uh, in fact i would have liked to do this uh, in person where you know the face to face interaction uh, could have been much more uh, but yeah uh, i mean in fact uh, i do keep coming to mumbai uh, every now and then uh, in fact i was there yeah. just last month but uh, uh, the, already there were two talks lined up so i had visited two places uh, i was thinking like if you can uh, if i can fit in uh, uh, one talk for wilson also but the way the schedule was uh, i could not do that and that's why i didn't contact you at that time but next time when i come to mumbai yeah. and uh, if i can uh, spare a day i will definitely contact you in advance so that uh, sure. you know i can do sure. this face to face and i would love that yes sir uh, thank you and all participants uh, we will use the same link for the next talk the next talk uh, will be at 11:45 okay thank you okay bye everyone bye sir bye sir the recording may be paused or you may even stop it.